What's up everyone, my name is Ale. Welcome back to my world of stocks. So you guys know Robert Kiyosaki, right? He's famous for the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. It's a very popular book, tons of people have read it. It's really turned him into a very popular financial guru, very famous investor. Generally, when Robert speaks, people in the economics world tend to listen. And he has now recently been saying that he predicts that we are about to experience the biggest market crash in history. So in today's video, I'm going to break down exactly what he said, why he's saying it, why he thinks that the market is about to crash, and I'll give you my own thoughts and reaction to all of it. I'll let you know what I think about it. And of course, I'll let you know what I'm doing myself to prepare for either scenario, both a market crash or a non-crash. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoy this video. Hit the like button if you do, and if you enjoy these updates on the economy once in a while. And uh, let's just go ahead and jump into it. Let's start by taking a look at what Mr. Kiyosaki said, and I'll give my reaction to all of it. Okay, now just in case you guys don't know a whole lot about Robert, I'll just quickly mention that he is a Japanese American who served in the Marines, he fought in the Vietnam War, and later he started his own company that brought the first nylon and Velcro surfer wallets to market. I actually remember using those myself because I lived on the West Coast for a long time and they're really popular out here. But anyway, that together with his various investments helped him acquire wealth and retire at the young age of 47. Now later in 1997, he would use that entrepreneurship and investing knowledge to write a book titled Rich Dad Poor Dad, which held a spot on the New York Times bestsellers list for six years in a row, became the number one best-selling personal finance book of all time, and led to Robert becoming one of the most famous authors and personal finance gurus of all time. Now fast forward to today, and Robert is predicting that the largest market crash in history is coming our way. In fact, he actually predicted that it would happen in October, given the financial collapse of Evergrande, who is the largest real estate developer in China, as well as Congress voting to raise our debt ceiling that month. But of course, we are here already in November, but regardless of what month it actually happens in, the point is that along with other financial gurus and famous investors, they are all kind of predicting that we are in a historic bubble and that a devastating crash will happen very soon because of that. And I speak of other financial gurus and famous investors. A couple examples would be someone like Michael Burry, who uh, is famous for predicting the 08 crash as well as the big short movie. You've probably seen that movie where he was in. It's a pretty popular movie. There's also Jeremy Grantham, who is famous for being the co-founder of the giant asset management firm GMO. And uh, he actually recently stated that the long, long bull market since 09 has finally matured into a fully fledged epic bubble featuring extreme overvaluation, explosive price increases, frenzied issuance, and historic uh, hysterically speculative investor behavior. And uh, he believes that this event will be recorded as one of the great bubbles of financial history. And there are many more who share these same opinions. But sticking with Robert though, he of course gives a similar outlook and his reasons for it are admittedly very compelling. In a recent interview, Robert stated that we have never had this much debt being pumped up before, leaving our debt to GDP ratio out of sync, which will inevitably lead to the biggest crash in world history, bringing everything down with it, including stocks, real estate, gold, silver, and even cryptocurrencies, at which point he notes that he will be buying gold, silver, and Bitcoin, all of which he believes will be a great buying opportunity during the crash. But when talking about stocks, he is actually very bearish, saying that he will not be buying stocks even during or right after the crash. And he doesn't really give an, any explanation why, other than mentioning that right now, like before the crash, he mentions, you know, a couple reasons why the stock market is propped up, but he doesn't really go into why it would not be a buying opportunity after the crash. But just kind of talking about, you know, sticking before the crash here, he mentions that the S&P 500 is really just the S&P 7 because of the giant corporations at the top. And he, he talks about uh, the fact that it's all really being held up by the Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen, and the Fed Chairman, Jerome Powell, 
who continue to create fake money that goes straight into pumping up the stock market, but doesn't actually go into the underlying economy itself, which is only allowing the rich to get richer while the poor and middle class get poorer. That's a big deal because the vast majority of our economy is consumer driven, but Robert believes that the result of this is that people are not going to spend money, which will lead to an economic disaster given our current debt bubble and the inability to service that debt if the consumer driven economy collapses. Although he does also mention that inflation is likely transitory, meaning that it's temporary because spending is going down, but money is being pumped in. So it's temporarily raising prices. But I'll give my own thoughts on that in a second because his explanation is a little weird. And I think I can do a little bit of a better job explaining that. But that was basically the interview. So moving over now to my reaction to everything that he said, I think we should break everything down, all of his views and predictions into four basic points so that I can quickly respond to each of them. And so those points, in my opinion, were that number one, that we're creating too much money and that our debt has become too massive and unstable, but that the inflation being caused is transitory. It's interesting, so I'll talk about that. Number two, that this money is uh, only propping up the markets, but not actually going into the underlying economy and helping regular people. Number three, that the result of those previous points will be that the markets will crash and it's going to happen extremely soon. It should only really be a matter of weeks or months rather than years. So we should be having a you know, biggest crash here very soon. And number four, that it will be a buying opportunity, but only for gold, silver, and Bitcoin, but not for stocks, which I think that was super interesting. Might have been the most interesting thing he said, and I definitely want to give my opinion on that as well. So let's quickly run through each of these, and I'll share my thoughts. Okay, now starting with point number one, that we are creating too much money and our debt has become too massive and unsustainable, although the inflation is transitory. And I almost agree 100% with him on this one, although his inflation remarks were a little weird and I'm not entirely convinced that it's transitory. I think some of it is, but not all, but I'll touch on that in a second. But starting with money, printing, and debt, Let's just look at the facts. Now, last year, the U.S. brought in about $3.5 trillion in revenue, but spent ne nearly double that amount at almost $6.6 .6 trillion, leaving us with a yearly deficit of over $3 trillion, in large part because of the recession as well as desperately needed stimulus and aid for the global health issue and because of all the lockdowns where we literally closed businesses down and told people not to work. But... That was more justified in 2020. Here in 2021, you would think that things are actually getting better, but in fact, it's actually gotten much worse. In just the first eight months of this year, we've already spent more than we did in all of last year combined, which was, again, during a recession and with much stricter lockdowns. And as a result, we are printing money at unbelievable amounts just to keep up with our insane spending budgets. In fact, one of the things that the Fed does when creating money is they buy assets, which increases their balance sheet. And as you can see on this chart, we obviously did that during the Great Recession, where we had a spike of around one to two trillion dollars. And yet that was nothing compared to what we've done over these last couple of years. I mean, you're talking about an overall increase of around four to five trillion. So around four times larger than what we did even during the Great Recession. And yet our recession of last year was actually way shorter, but we still created around four times more money. That's crazy. And because of all of that money printing, our M2 money supply skyrocketed from around 15 trillion in 2020 to over 20 trillion today. In other words, around a quarter of all US dollars in circulation were pretty much created in just the past one to two years. And as you would expect with such an insane increase in money, inflation has been on the rise. Gas prices are now at a seven year high and are expected to continue climbing. The Fed's own preferred measure for inflation is at the highest level in three decades. And new reports are coming out that the average household in America is having to pay close to $200 more every single month because of that inflation. All the meanwhile, our, our national debt continues to soar and is now reaching nearly th uh, $30 trillion. So yeah, Robert is absolutely right. We are creating way too much money and our debt levels are absolutely not sustainable. However, I'm not totally sure that I agree with him that our inflation is transitory. I definitely think a lot of it is, 
Um, I would say that a lot of our inflation is being caused by supply chains breaking down and backing up all the different regulations because of the pepperoni. Everything that's going on is really hurting our supply chains. And that in itself is causing a lot of inflation, which I think that can and will be fixed over time. And as our supply chains return to normal levels, I think a lot of the pressure on inflation will come back down. However, at the same time, I still feel that we have way too much debt and I'm not sure how we get out of all of this massive debt that we're creating without having to inflate our way out of it. And that's what personally scares me the most because I don't know how we're going to be able to service so much debt. And rather than getting out of it by it, you know, printing our way out of it, I think a better solution would be to stop spending and focus on getting people back to work, which actually brings us to point number two, because I'm about to show you how, how I feel that all of this is really connected. And so looking at it here, point number two states that all of this money is just propping up the market and is not actually helping the underlying economy. And once again, I have to agree with Robert. Now, to be fair, without a, without a lot of this stimulus, the economy would have probably collapsed, but that doesn't justify our continued spending or our lack of getting people back to work. Instead of simply investing the money into improved health measures so that people can work safely and keeping the two weeks to slow the spread actually down to two weeks, we've instead told everyone to stay home, not work, and in some cases not even pay their rent. And now the result is that, you know what, a lot of people simply just don't want to go back to work and you can't really blame them. We kind of incentivized that behavior because we told them to stay home and we provide enhanced unemployment and rent cancellations, which has now led us into what is being referred to as the great resignation by many outlets and media and, and you know, different uh, publications. I mean, according to the Washington Post, there are 8.4 million people out of a job, despite the country having over 10 million job openings. And even if you agree with the current strategy and think that it's justified to pay people to stay home, which, you know, that's, you know, that's your argument, it's a fair argument. But you still can't ignore the fact that at you know over the long term, this will only hurt us regular people while transferring all of the wealth to giant corporations. Because as small businesses were told to close down, giants like Amazon, Walmart, Target, and so on were deemed essential and they were allowed to rake in record-breaking profits along with giant tech companies that benefit from people using online services like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and more. So you ask, is this propping up the markets and being disconnected from reality? The answer is yes. The, you look at the tech-heavy NASDAQ, and it more than doubled from last year's lows and has seen the absolute largest and sharpest spike in history. I, circle, I circled it here in red, showing the past five decades, and you can see just how massive that climb was. And when looking at the Schiller P ratio for the S&P 500, we can see that we are trading at one of the highest, you know, most expensive times in history, I mean, on this chart here, it's the second most expensive, only behind the dot-com bubble, which we all know what a disaster that was, and we are currently over 100% more expensive than the historical average, leaving us in the red extreme bubble range. So again, I agree with Robert here. The stock market is absolutely propped up thanks to the global health issue that really crushed small businesses and basically transfer the American people's wealth straight over to giant corporations who have been recording record-breaking profits while the rest of us are left paying, you know, close to $200 more a month because of inflation, which I personally feel is really a tax on the poor and the middle class and not so much the rich, but it is what it is. That leads us to point number three, which is that the stock market is likely to crash soon. And this is where Again, I, I agree with Robert on some of this, not all of it. I agree that the market is definitely propped up. There's no doubt about that. Valuations are very high. The market needs to come down. I would agree 100% on that. Where Robert and other financial gurus and economists and the media really start to lose me is when they try to predict when it'll happen. Now, obviously, Robert predicted that it would happen in October. We're now in November. So he thinks it's going to happen any day now. And that's where I just can't get on board with that because... I do not agree with trying to time the market. I think it's practically impossible. Sure, I think people can get lucky at times, but even then, I don't really think it's luck. I think it's an inevitability because a lot of these people try to predict a crash every single year and eventually it has to happen because market crashes happen. And if you predict a crash every single year, eventually you will be right. And I don't have to look very far back into history. I can just look at recent history to show you complete you know, evidence of that. If you just look back at the 08, 09 crash, the Great Recession crash, 
What has happened every single year since then? You've had financial gurus left and right, economists, the media, everyone predicting a market crash every single year, selling you panic and fear every single year. And what ended up happening? The complete opposite of what they said would happen. We ended up having one of the biggest and largest and longest bull runs in history. So they were not just wrong, they were completely wrong. I mean, the complete opposite happened of everything that they predicted that they've been predicting every single year. By the way, Robert himself wrote a book in 2013 predicting, you guessed it, the biggest market crash in history. And he ended up being wrong and he's been wrong ever since. So, and that's not to, a knock on Robert. I actually really like Robert. I agree with a lot of the things he says, but I disagree with him when you try to make predictions like that on when it's going to happen. Obviously a crash will happen at some point, but I don't know when that'll be. Now, obviously, you could argue that over the past decade, we've had quantitative easing, we've had manipulation by the Fed. So there's reasons why the market just kept getting propped up. But I mean, we're still doing that today. The US dollar is still really the preferred currency around the world. We're not the only ones printing money. There's, you know, countries all over the world printing money. So I don't know exactly what the what the fallout of all of this will be. I think it's going to end very badly, but I don't know how long this market will last, whatever kind of market we're in right now. It could last a while. It could last a very small amount of time. I really have no idea. And that brings us to point number four, which is that this will be a buying opportunity for gold, silver, Bitcoin, but not for stocks. And again, this is somewhere where Robert loses me. Now, I agree with him, it will be a buying opportunity, but he loses me when he tries to say that it's not gonna be a buying opportunity for stocks. Why would it not be a buying opportunity for stocks? Now, okay, we could nitpick this and we could get really deep into it and make some arguments here, but I mean, we could also just keep it simple and just look at all of our history and say that every single time that there's been a crash or a correction or a big you know, market drop, a bear market, you have everyone telling you that it is not a buying opportunity. You have everyone telling you to sell, sell, sell and lose your money and sell for losses when in reality you should have been buying. And so, you know, I, I don't really wanna go much deeper than that. I personally will be buying super heavy on any stock market crash, just like I've always done and I've always done very well off of it. What I would kinda suggest is that you focus on some certain things to make sure that you can survive those market crashes and come out on top. And that is to focus on your career. Make sure you have a good, solid, reliable job. Now, granted, sometimes that could be out of your control because maybe during you know a recession or some really bad economic time, you may lose your job. Okay, well, that's where plan B comes in, which is to have savings. When times are good, you should be saving money. You should be doing well and saving money. Again, I understand there's, there's you know, outliers, certain people will struggle, but I'm just saying, you know, ideally you have a good job, you should be saving some money and not just for emergencies, but you should also be saving money for buying opportunities for when the market does crash, which also leads me to another point. Don't invest all of your money in stocks and invest with money that you really don't need because if the market crashes and that's going to destroy your life, that's not a good thing. And I get comments from people and I'm not trying to talk badly about anyone, I'm trying to help you guys. I get comments from people that say, I have all of my money invested in Tesla or I have all of my money invested in Bitcoin. Personally, you know, do what you guys wanna do, but I think that's a very poor decision. I recommend or I suggest or whatever, what I like to do, I don't like to tell you guys what to do, but what I like to do is I like to diversify. I like to have cash outside of the stock market for buying opportunities. And I also like to have emergency funds if things really go badly just all over. So I don't know, for me, whenever I've stuck to those principles, long-term, I've always done very well. And I continue to invest in stocks. And when the stock market crashes or drops or corrects, whatever, I just buy heavier, I lower my cost bases, and then I ride up the recovery and I end up making tons of money. And then I post those videos on YouTube and sometimes people are so shocked at how much I'm up on a certain position. And it's not like I'm a genius, it's not like I'm doing anything special, it's a simple formula. You just buy more when prices go down. And you do everything in your power to make sure that you're in a situation where you can actually do that. So anyway, those are my feelings. Uh, I agree with Robert on a lot of things. It probably will be a buying opportunity for many different asset classes, but I think it'll also be a buying opportunity for stocks as well. And um, I think the market does need to come down, but I just don't know when that'll be. So anyway, those are my opinions. Those are my thoughts. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts down below. Do you agree or disagree with anything I said? Anything that Robert said? I'd love to hear your own thoughts and I'll try to respond to as many comments as I can. 
Thank you for watching. Please hit the like button if you did enjoy the video. I will catch you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.